Good afternoon. This is State Senator Bob Guida representing the 27 towns of District 2. Um, just like to update uh, the citizens uh, in the viewing area as to what's going on down in Concord, uh, in the Senate specifically. Uh, a great deal of activity, a great deal of spending. Um, I'm going to cover the major areas that we're trying to address uh, in terms of uh, systemic problems. Then I'll talk about uh, my bills, uh, 15 bills that I'm the prime sponsor for. Um, obviously, opioids, mental health, public safety, those are big areas. We're, we are um, moving forward with a 10-year mental health plan. We're building, uh, hopefully, a, uh, a facility for uh, mental health uh, uh, patients. Rather than sitting in the state hospital or in emergency rooms around the state, lying in beds or cots out in the hall, uh, this is an issue that has been uh, raised and we're addressing that uh, both with the governor's proposed budget and uh, with le legislation that we're passing in the Senate and I'm sure in the House. Um, we are uh, very well aware that the, the underlying cause for much of what happens uh, later on in life in terms of crime or, or drug addiction and so forth is the result of mental health issues and so you'll see an awful lot of money going towards mental health issues in, the, in this biennial budget, both construction and programs. Um, uh, my own specific bills, I, I rather energetic, I, I introduced 15 bills as a prime sponsor this year, and I'll just go down those in order of uh, their listing. Senate Bill 120 <coughs> um, is addressing the prescription drug monitoring program. This is a program that all providers and dispensers are required to use so that we can determine patterns of abuse or misuse by providers, by users, by by um, prescribers and that right now the PDMP program is managed by the Board of Pharmacy. It's problematic because the Board of Pharmacy is a peer for the Board of Medicine, the Board of Nursing, the Board of Dentistry and any other health care boards. The program obviously needs to be in an overwatch situation for that and so we're going to use this legislation to bring the prescription drug monitoring program uh, out, of, out of pharmacy and put it in what's called the Office of Professional Licensure and Certification, OPLC, which is essentially the administrative oversight agency for all the boards of licensing. Uh, an important st structural change that will enable the, the bill to, I'm sorry, the program to work much more efficiently uh, and much more effectively. Um, <clears throat> Senate Bill 121, uh, as you recall, we had two major storms back in 2017, great deal of flooding, great deal of damage. Uh, one of the uh, consequences of that storm was a complete washout of the Weeks Crossing Dam up in the town of Warren. Uh, so we have managed to work with the Department of Environmental Services and Fish and Game, both of whom had a stake in that dam, uh, to get a, an appropriation to rebuild the dam. And at the conclusion of that, the state will divest itself of responsibility, the town of Warren will take it. Um, <clears throat> another bill, uh, Senate Bill 132, a very simple bill, to rename Lake Wickwas uh, over in Meredith area uh, with its proper spelling, W-I-C-W-A-S. And so apparently there's some concerns with GPS and, and national maps that um, misspelled the name, so we're going to get that squared away. Senate Bill 134 is uh, a housekeeping bill that was uh, requested of me by uh, Commissioner Lindsay Stepp of the Department of Revenue Administration. Uh, our rooms and, and uh, or, I'm sorry, meals and rentals tax uh, has been the subject of a great deal of confusion and ambiguity. It's a hodgepodge of rules and, and statutes that have been put together over decades. Uh, definitely requires a cleanup. So this bill cleans that up. Doesn't add any new taxes, doesn't change any taxes. It just really does a revamp um, ordering um, the meals and rentals tax uh, in a much better way so that it's not uh, confusing to users. And it will clarify definitions that really comprise a significant amount of the um, the in compliance issues that uh, our revenue administration folks have to deal with. Uh, we'll clean it up for businesses, we'll clean it up for DRA, all in all a, a win for the state. Um, Senate Bill 148 uh, is a bill that will require uh, the state to notify employees as they're hired uh, of the cost of their dues. Um, the fact that they have an option not to join a union uh, it will also require that the state as an employer provide unions with the opportunity in a timely fashion to address new employees um, uh, in fairness uh, to, uh, to the process. Um, <clears throat> Senate Bill 158 uh, is a bill that's 
uh, comes out of some concerns that I have regarding um, associations that have lobbyists in Concord that are paid for by taxpayer funds appropriated at town meetings around the state. Uh, but the taxpayers are not aware that those lobbyists are working. They don't know that that association has a lobbyist. And in many cases, those lobbyists are working contrary to the interests of the people, but for the interests of uh, towns or, or government of some form. So I think it's just a transparency bill to try to uh, get the, the fact across that money that you're spending as a taxpayer is being used to lobby against your interests as a citizen. Oh, sure. New Hampshire Municipal is one. Oh. Sure. There's one. I mean, there's the Clerks Association, to the degree that they have lobbyists. Certainly an HMA is, is, is there. Uh, they have more than one lobbyist, and they spend significant amounts of money. But this bill would require them to break out those funds in a separate account and to account for them separately. Um, and and uh, uh, I'll probably amend that bill to have them require it to be stated in their request for an appropriation to the towns that some of this money is going to lobbying efforts. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, Senate Bill 173, a very important bill. Um, our hospitals, our schools uh, are all struggling with a very cumbersome background check process, um, which is costing us jobs because right across the border in Vermont or in Maine or in Massachusetts, they don't have such problems. They're a very streamlined system. Our system is archaic. This will essentially enable an employer with a secure portal to plug in and get information instantly, uh, you know, with a fee uh, on a per, uh, per inquiry basis, but will streamline. Um, and it also maintains this, the, the, the privacy of information that should not be disclosed by law. Uh, for as an example, <clears throat> we have two types of background checks that are done. The state background check, if you're going to apply as a teacher, or you're going to work as a caregiver in a hospital or a nursing home, you have to have a state background check. And right now the process has taken up to three to four weeks, sometimes five or six weeks to get that done. Meantime, a person's getting hired out of state where their processes are virtually automated. So this will be an update to that um, and, and protect the information that is private, but allow it public disclosure of the information that is public information. Specifically, that's convictions. Um, and so if a person has committed a crime and been convicted, that is public information, but it's not stored in any central location in the state. It's stored at separate courthouses in all the 10 districts. Uh, counties rather, and so we're going we're gonna to amalgamate that data into one central database and allow public access to it for a fee. The fee, of course, to help sustain the cost of uh, maintaining the, the program. <coughs> Senate Bill 187, a really uh, um, involved bill, in fact, I had a meeting this morning in Concord. Uh, this bill uh, is at the request of the Snowmobile Association, the Trails Bureau, um, and because the current funding structure and mechanism and, and, and revenues for maintaining the grants and aid for the trail system that maintain our entire snowmobile trail uh, system, which brings $660 million a year in, in revenues to the, to, to the, to the state um, businesses, um, is, is failing. So we're going to revamp that. We're going to raise fees. We're going to look at possibly looking to appropriate funds. We're going to form a study commission to look at taking a part of the, uh, a particular revenue stream yet to be determined and committing it to uh, the Trails uh, Grants and Aid Program. This bill, if passed, will enable the state to get out of the business of liens and loaning and, and enable the clubs to get compensated much more fairly for the work that the club members put in in maintaining grooming trails uh, and allow the clubs themselves to purchase the, the uh, grooming machines. Uh, Senate Bill 188, uh, the Naswa Resort over on Lake, uh, on, on uh, Met, uh, Winnipesaukee uh, has a beautiful display of red, white, and blue lights on its docks. Current state law says that they can't display that because any lights that uh, resemble uh, navigation lights in color can't be legally displayed. Well, this, these light displays over at the NASWA are for, uh, to commemorate and to honor veterans. They're red, white, and blue, okay? And so uh, red and white lights under current law are not legal, so they looked at the prospect of shutting down the beautiful light display on their docks. So the, uh, the Marine Patrol guys uh, got together with myself and the owner of the Naswa, and we decided, you know what, we'll leave it up to the discretion of the Marine Patrol officers doing the inf inspections to decide whether the configuration of those lights looks like a boat and might confuse a boater at night. So obviously it leaves some discretion there where there wasn't on prior. Uh, Senate Bill 208, an important bill as well. This bill codifies in law 
what Governor Sununu did uh, two years ago by executive order, uh, enabling our National Guard to basically become the repository for all things veteran and military in the state. So we have a very effective but somewhat fragmented uh, uh, veteran service organizations around the state. This brings them all under one roof, puts it all under the military, gives them many more facilities, gives them better funding, uh, better outreach, and better uh, uh, ability to reach the, the veterans who may be in need who are reaching out. So instead of just having one or two or three locations at any National Guard armory or training facility around the state, there'll be a VSO, veteran service officer, uh, able to get in touch with a veteran in need. Senate Bill 231, an interesting bill, truth and political advertising bill. Um, <clears throat> those of you that live through the campaign and those of us who do the campaigning uh, are inundated by negative and often false advertising. Uh, and so the, what this bill said was, we're going to allow the Committee on uh, uh, Legislative Ethics uh, to opine when a candidate brings forward what is believed to be false or misleading advertising. And it's very specific in its definition of that. It has to be demonstrably false based on a vote that was taken in a recorded roll call vote or verifiable by video in a non-recall vote, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in a, um, uh, a non-roll call vote uh, to, uh, to look at this and say, you know what, that's false and to assess a penalty that's very significant against either the campaign or the out-of-state organization. Many of these um, issues organizations will put forth flagrantly false advertising, whether it's the parties or advocacy organizations. We're trying to clean up politics, folks, and it's, it's very difficult uh, because as, pu as public officials, we are targets of opportunity. I don't believe that it does the citizens any good to make a better choice in electing people uh, if, if the candidates or organizations are, out to, are allowed to mislead the public in, into misstating what these people represent. And I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, it goes both ways. <coughs> Senate Bill 294, uh, working with uh, Deb Narrow, um, a longtime friend, former legislator, lives here in Warren, is the uh, director of CATI, uh, Communities for an Alcohol and Drug-Free Youth. Um, when the downturn came, uh, you know, six or seven years ago and the, the revenues went in the tank, many good programs were canceled, just no funding. Well, as we've begun to see the resurgence with a booming economy and revenues returning to the state coffers, uh, juvenile justice, um, uh, diversion. Uh, this is about diversion of juveniles that are uh, get themselves into trouble. If you take a juvenile to court, uh, the court system has bad outcomes in terms of recidivism. Their recidivism rates about 41 percent, uh, and the average cost is between 30 and 53 thousand dollars for a case. If we do, do diversion, the average cost is 2,500, and the recidivism rate is half, it's down to 21%. Much better outcomes because you're working proactively and constructively with the, person, with the young man or lady uh, rather than submitting or you know, exposing them to the court system and then possible incarceration and, and parole and all those types of things. Much better outcomes uh, by, by constructively working with diversion. And so I sponsored that bill. Uh, we're asking for an appropriation to allow those centers, which already exist in many cities in the state, in larger towns that have the, the tax bases, to fund such programs, smaller towns, Plymouth, Warren, Holderness, whatever, do not. So this will enable uh, regional centers to open, privately operated, but funded with grants that will help them use the diversion. Saves a great deal of money and time, saves lives in the long pull too, as far as uh, the uh, convictions for our youngsters. Senate Bill 306, the Housing Appeals Board Bill. Uh, we have a terrible problem with housing in the state. Terrible shortage, costs keep rising. Uh, no inventory. Uh, a large part of that is because um, we have such restrictive planning board and zoning board regulations that are many times used to weaponize the court system. And by that I mean <clears throat> if a planning board or zoning board has a particular issue or a particular type of housing, let's say workforce housing, which, were, which is in desperately short supply, those boards can and do make decisions more often than we'd like to know that will protract the, uh, the debate long enough that investors will leave projects for workforce or balanced housing uh, and the projects will collapse. Ergo, we have young people that are leaving the state because they're not, uh, not able to afford housing. We have companies that are not coming into the state because there isn't any housing. Uh, this establishes a board, three people appointed by the Supreme Court, uh, to adjudicate uh, 
decisions by land use boards, planning board, zoning board of adjustment, whatever, uh, and make sure that they are operating within the confines of their own ordinances and state laws as well. Uh, if the town or the individual or an abutter doesn't like the decision of this body, they take it to court just like they do now. What this does is establish an alternative track rather than lengthy and expensive court battles. This is an administrative hearing procedure at the end of which all parties retain the right to take it to court, but this, this gets it done in 180 days, not the two, three, five, sometimes seven or eight years it takes to get these rendered at the local through the, through the superior courts. So again, trying to expedite the process without eliminating any of the rights of any of the parties so we can get housing on track and try to get, to get some more housing built. Uh, Senate Bill 313, right to know, I chaired a commission two years ago uh, on a very important issue. Uh, you know, transparency in government is critical, and our Constitution even speaks to that, uh, specifically under, um, well, statutorily, uh, 91. You'll hear it talk about 91A, uh, the right to know law. And so there are numerous examples of egregious violations of the spirit and intent uh, of this law. And so what this does is establish a right to know ombudsman, a person to whom an individual who feels that they are entitled to information but is being denied, or a government agency, whether it's local, state, uh, or county, uh, can turn to get an opinion. And, uh, and so... Again, the only alternative we have right now is for an individual is to take them to superior court, take the town or the city or the county to superior court. Very expensive, truly a chiller. It chills the intent of good people that have righteous requests because the sheer cost and time involved hiring a lawyer and so forth. What this does is it, it balances the playing field. It says, you know what? We don't think this decision by the local board was right. We're going to take it to the ombudsman. The ombudsman renders an opinion or a decision. If either party doesn't like that decision, they're still free to take it to court like they do now. Again, it's an alternative track administratively to allow much more expeditious and less expensive, not only for the individual, but for the towns as well, because they have to hire attorneys and take them to the court uh, as well to adjudicate these cases under current law. Again, an option. <clears throat> and the, my final bill was Senate Bill 317, uh, Sanctuary Cities. Um, in New Hampshire, we have several towns and cities that have declared themselves as sanctuary cities illegally and unconstitutionally. Uh, what that does is essentially says that a police officer that finds an illegal immigrant uh, will not turn them over to ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Well, unfortunately, while that's very uh, compassionate in many cases, the fact of the matter is a disproportionately high number of our crimes are being committed by illegal immigrants, and the cost is staggering in our state. Uh, the cost is up or over $200 per household per year in taxes you're paying to support services for illegals. Uh, you know, I totally support legal immigration. Both my sets of grandparents were legal immigrants. I've tracked them back through Ellis Island. Uh, and, and, you know, immigration, legal immigration, uh, is the benefit of the country because people are coming in, going to play by the rules. What we have is a situation where the illegals just come crashing across the border. Um, and those who are legal immigrants are being deserved uh, because they're being patient and waiting in line, awaiting their turn. Uh, incredible amounts of crime, incredible amounts of drugs, all of the things that we know are, are scourges in our country today are happening because uh, of illegal immigrants, for the most part, bringing them across the border. The open border to Mexico is a huge problem. Uh, that's an area for federal uh, involvement. Um, but at this point in time, sanctuary cities do no good for the citizens of New Hampshire. They enable lawbreakers to stay in our towns uh, and, and, and receive benefits at our expense. Again, lawful immigration is the backbone of making America great and keeping her great, but illegal immigrants betray the process and their fellow citizens. So that's a quick rehash <coughs> of what's going on with my bills. We talk a little bit about uh, budgeting. I'm on the Finance Committee in the Senate, also the Ways and Means Committee. Finance is appropriating the funds to the various programs to make government work. Ways and means is how we raise the funds. I also serve on Energy and, uh, and uh, Natural Resources Committee. <coughs> uh, with regard to finance, both the House and the Senate, uh, democratically controlled. Uh, as a result of the last election, uh, I know in the Senate, as of 10.30 Thursday night last when we recessed, I'm sorry, when we adjourned from that session, uh, we... The Senate had appropriated over $330 million above and beyond the budget. Uh, huge overspending. 
have proposed uh, a family medical leave program, which sounds nice, is essentially it's an income tax. It's a tax on 0.5% of everybody's income. It's not voluntary, you gotta pay it, uh, to support a program that um, we're not sure will work. Governor Sununu is working, and I have worked for the last two years plus, uh, on a voluntary program run by the insurance companies, not run by the state, uh, not setting up a state insurance agency, uh, that will enable people to get family medical leave for those times in life when it's, it's, it's warranted. Uh, so there are two competing plans. Uh, the Senate rammed it through uh, with their majority um, with an income tax and the Governor Sununu and a group of people, myself included, are working with insurers and, and businesses to, uh, to, to um, provide a voluntary program that isn't a tax and is voluntary. It's, you'll hear it called the Twin State uh, uh, family medical leave program. We're twinning with Vermont so we can get our, our respective state workforces together as a core group upon which the insurance companies can base actuarial estimates. And then once we have that, then uh, we will move, proceed to open that up to uh, all. Now, one of the reasons that there isn't more detail given on these plans, uh, the governor's plan, is that he's involved, this involves negotiating with the unions. Okay, and those are in progress and I've been assured that this is an open item on the table. And um, while they're at an impasse over wages, um, and they're going to get a mediator and potentially go to, ar potentially go to arbitration, uh, if that's warranted, um, this family medical leave, the twin state family medical leave is alive and well. Well, the details can't be hammered out again because they're part of negotiations which are by law confidential. So lots happening in Concord. Um, uh, I, <coughs> I continue to hear uh, from good many of you, I can always hear from more. That helps me shape my thoughts on, on how to support or oppose legislation. Uh, many controversial issues coming up on both sides of the wall, the House and the Senate, and uh, hope to report back to you again soon in a, in a few more weeks. As we get over to crossover, uh, that's March 28th. That's the date by which all bills from the Senate have to be passed over to the House, and all bills from the House passed over to the Senate where they die in their respective chambers. So uh, this, the governor having proposed his budget, uh, Senate to the House and the Senate. The House is now working on its version of the budget. The House Constitutional is responsible for actually developing the budget. The government can propose it. The House has to develop it. It will then come to the Senate and will go through the business of negotiating yeas and nays and how much is and what ifs and, and so forth uh, and all the uh, uh, associated um, uh, legalities with forming the state budget for the next two years. With that, I will wish you all the very best of the day. Uh, we're thrilled to know that Spring is threatening. It's been a long and arduous winter. Um, been a good winter for snowmobiling, skiing. Uh, I, I look forward to spring and I look forward to getting back uh, to you with another report in the future.